Okay, we are currently live streaming our interview. Uh, not live streaming, this is all recorded locally. I'll be uploading it later. Um, but this is the interview uh, with Luke Layton from um, the Ecomex Sexy 8 <laughs> project with the SOC. Yeah, the system on a chip, um, which is super awesome. I, I bought the t shirt back in the day. Um, Luke now is. Um, interested in the open gpu um open hardware space he's working on would you call a libra gpu or a libra soc libra libra gpu libra gpu awesome awesome yeah uh there's a, there's a there is a big difference uh, um open has no guarantee that people can have the rights to uh program and etc etc um, whereas libra um, can face and confers those rights just as in the for, for software free okay just applied to hardware okay it, interesting thing is interesting is that we're not actually doing it for freedom reasons we're actually doing it for business reasons but yeah okay okay <laughs> um I'll go, I'll go into that if we can like sure sure and I guess we'll kind of jump into the interview. Um, um, I, I kind of had a, a brief introduction there, but Luke, do you want to maybe introduce yourself a bit more thoroughly and introduce the project, your current project, a little a little more thoroughly as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, my name is Luke Logan. Um, I consider myself to be um, an ethical soft specialist these days. Um, uh, uh, that means, um, for example, uh, uh, not going and working for Facebook, <laughs> where, I would, my, where the skills that I have would empower them to continue their deeply unethical um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, way of uh, working. Um, it, it, it's, it's quite a... a, 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 a taking responsibility and actually making the choice can I help should I help empower these people to continue um, their things and continue what they're doing or can I influence them to ethical so that's the kind of decisions that I make um, uh, uh, thing um, so uh, the, the, the Libra GPU the Libra Sub project um, is was formed after because uh, in the number 68 I did a huge review of uh, different processes and SOCs that are available not one single one of them in 12 years of studying SOCs had uh, source code available firmware BIOS uh, drivers um, uh, GPU CPU VPU uh, crypto processor, um, uh, everything. They all have some sort of sort of lock-in, uh, uh, DRM, uh, 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 BIOS lock-in, um, you know, with uh, fuses, e-fuses, um, or they have a proprietary VPU or proprietary uh, GPU um, uh, firmware block. And the amount of effort that is going into reverse engineering these is mental and it's almost criminal I got earliest when I'm starting a Libra SOC project so, so I would complete so, yeah that's what exists okay I, I, I would agree with you um, for, for maybe some more people that aren't familiar with kind of the Libra hardware space why would you say it's, it's criminal for these companies to act the way they're acting um, well let's um, in talking with Dr. Storman um, at the 3M Deb meeting, he mentioned um, it, it was a real nice surprise that he turned up at 3M Deb's uh, um, uh, uh, online uh, uh, call um, last month. Um, he mentioned that somebody had got a smartphone in which they'd installed Replicant and they took it to a foreign country. Now, what then happened was that when it registered on the international roaming network, over them, the foreign government completely reinstalled their operating system, completely wiped 
operate all of their, their replicant operating system without their consent whilst the phone was switched off. Nominally switched off because it's just a GPIO button, not an actual physical switch. But the standard version of Android. So that, that's extremely serious. And it's the kind of thing that a Libra uh, SOC would not allow and not permit because the, um, there would be no means by which a, um, a, 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 a government or, or a, a criminal could gain a backdoor to your processor. Yeah? So it's these kinds of things that, to, that I think is unless this for everything, including the hardware, no amount of secure software is going to help you. So, um, uh, so this is why I decided to, to actually do a full, to go right down the uh, rabbit hole, get into hardware design, ASIC design. Well, well, Luca, pretty much on behalf of everyone you know thank you for, for doing this because this is really important work really crucial um you know i'm just seeing more and more vulnerabilities with intel platforms um intel has that yeah. intel management engine which kind of has full access to your computer amd has the same thing um it's it's nice to be seeing some new progress in the open hardware space with with power nine um, a little bit more with some, some with Risk Five too, but there's, there's actually hardware you can buy with Power Nine that's open that you can get get, get right now. Um, it's really great to see us making progress in the right direction. Um, I mean, the, the, the really interesting thing is that Intel and AMD and ARM, uh, the, the the licensing itself ARM that is, you know, like Qualcomm and etc. They can't do this. They can't do what we're doing, and the reason is because. Um, over the past 30 years, Intel, AMD, and etc., they've licensed, licensed third-party um, what's called RTL from about 40 or 50 different companies. If they wanted to release the, the, the RTL of the A Intel, whatever it is, or the AMD, whatever it is, they can't because they'd have to get permission all the, all, all the companies that they've licensed third party stuff from, some of which those companies would have gone bust, bankrupt. <laughs> so it's a real uh, sort of a, a, a buying. Um, uh, it's quite quite, a, quite interesting. So uh, yeah. Okay, so so that, that can, that's a great uh, lead way into the first question that I have for you. So. Um, <laughs> I would say, and, and maybe you would agree with me, um, it, it seems to be the case that current um, modern processors are a little more transparent, maybe slightly more open than um, modern GPUs. Like there's 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 more you know about modern processors, or maybe maybe there's better drivers if if that's what I'm thinking about properly. Um, but my, my question is, you know, why do you suppose there, there hasn't been a Libra GPU in the past? Has there not been enough money? Has there been an engineering problem? What's kind of the big issue? Well, I'll answer the first bit. Um, the processors, general purpose processors, are open at the instruction level because they have to be. You have to have the compilers. Therefore, and you have, and, you, and people have to be able to write assembler, so you have to know what the instruction. And a little bit of analysis, you can deduce that um, the, this particular instruction is slow or has a latency or whatever. So you sort of slowly over time, people reverse engineer the internal pipeline workings of the different processors. Um, and, uh, GPUs uh, are a totally different beast. The level of performance now and the specialization is mental. There is a bar, a threshold, um, which is of performance, which is so high 
It's basically supercomputers. Every, every it's sitting inside your phone is basically what would be considered a supercomputer of, of 20 years ago. Wow. And it's done, and all it is is it's doing a few received effects, you know, sort of when you waggle your phone around, it makes the background go in a you know, sort of a, um, a, a, a parallax thing. Ooh, <laughs> and that great. I mean, it's, it's the level of performance required to do those kinds of effects. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's there have been some small projects uh, a fixed on opencourse.org there is a fixed shader 3D triangle rendering piece of hardware an RTL it's an MSC project um, uh, 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 I think it's an o, o -R -G -F -X, open rendering graphics or something like that you can look it up on opencourse.org if that had been released 25 years ago, it would have been absolutely amazing as a commercial product. It would have been state of the art 25 years ago. Yeah? Um, so, basically, why has there been no Libra GPU? Because the bar has been raised so high. Um, that you know the expert tech smartphone processors and, and tablets and desktop PCs and graphics cards now uh, was uh, 120 teraflops for that performance for the Nvidia graphics cards of a, a couple of, of a couple of years ago. Um, so with that bar rate being raised so high, people are basically given up. In the, in the Libra open community, people have just gone, well, I just didn't consider doing that. So they don't even try. Yeah. Um, and I, I, just, I just went, that's not good enough. I, I set the goal. I'll find out. I just set the goal. And it goes from there. It, the, everything snowballs from there. Um, all this, you know, sort of like quote all sorts of silly things about you know, the journey begins with the, with the first step and all that bullshit. Um, but it's true, it does. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have to tell me where you're getting your drive from, Luke, because that is impressive. <laughs> but, yeah, it, I, I don't, but the interesting thing is that a lot of people in the open community they do things because it's fun. Okay. Um, they do it because they enjoy it and the thing. They don't. They don't do it because it's the right thing to do, or because it's to correct some massive imbalance. Because that's painful. Okay. Right? To be honest, you know, committing yourself for, for to, to, to a project for you know three, four, five, seven, eight, ten years. That's that's pretty. No, most people wouldn't do that. Um, I think, and it's interesting. I am actually running up against uh, difficulties of communicating with people um, in this project. Um, uh, there's sort of a mismatch because I'm picking things not because it's fun, but because it's the right thing to do, and people can't really cope with that. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, well, interesting. Yeah, that is that is fun to think about. If if, if it's fun, you you're gonna do it anyway. So that's that's a good belief to have. So so do you expect operating systems to have an easier time to develop drivers for a Libra GPU? I, I suppose that's pretty obvious. Uh, well, it is and it isn't. At least telling it. Um, the the traditional way. Uh, okay. If we were doing a completely separate GPU, um, CPU, GPU architecture, traditional one way that it's done commercially it, by every, everybody, NVIDIA, Intel, etc., etc., um, uh, PowerVR, Mali, all these things, the answer would be no. Um, uh, and the reason for that is because when you have a split arch 
architecture, you have to have shared memory communication between the two, right? Because it's completely different instruction sets and it's completely different processor. They don't even share any. They don't even. Uh, you know, the, in some uh, architectures, the ones that have PCI Express graphics card, even share memory. It's the PCI Express bus which maps memory maps the Spix card's memory into the shared memory space of the processor. And that's the only way that you get data across. So when you make a function call, in an OpenGL function call, the parameters and any data that is needed has to be packed up, marshaled, shipped over to the GPU, where the GPU's um, driver unpacks those function call arguments. It's using remote procedure calls, effectively. Oh. Oh. Unserializes those, makes the function and then and then ships the answers back to the chip, back to the CPU and exactly on the reverse route. Well, it's just mental, completely insane, and it's no wonder they, that they, these these um you know that the programming is so challenging, difficult, and um, and debugging is you know on impossible. So what we decided long time so, you know right at the start of the project decided that's but it's insane not doing it and instead decided to do, do what's called a hybrid CPU, GPU, VPU where you add native accelerated instructions to the CPU's instruction set and what that means is that your shader binaries you compile it there and then to the just-in-time compile it there and then, and execute it on the CP. There is no separate GPU. There is no separate VPU. You are literally just in time executing native shader binaries. And that means that developing of the drivers is automatically and inherently much easier. Okay. So... so I, am I correct in saying this is part of the success of the new Apple ARM chip? So they do something similar? No, they've gone the opposite route. They've gone the mental okay. route. Okay. What they've done is they put in a series of completely separate, accelerated blobs all over the place. Oh, okay. Um, because the, the difference... Um, remember, they've got millions of dollars, you know, billions of dollars to play with, so you can do these and chuck thousands of engineers at different tasks. So, um, what they've done is, because they've got so much money, they, they, they can throw uh, a one block which does a computational job, write the software drivers to do that, and of course, because you're buying a Mac, you don't need Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of other reasons. There's a very good uh, article on medium.com which explains why the hardware itself is more efficient, and it's to do with the fact that the in the ARM V8 instruction set, the instructions are now fixed 32 bit and they're very regular and even. So, multi issue, you can decode, you can detect early the length of the instruction such that you can do a multi-issue and they can completely 100% saturate engines, multiple parallel execution engines using out of order for um, a thing, where for uh, ARM and, X and Intel, because of the, because the instructions are variable length, they have one hell of a job. Um, you can't actually fill, it's so the x86 instruction set between one and 15 bytes or something for AVX 12. Well, um, uh, you can't get multi issue execution done properly and efficiently. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah. So that's why, but going back to a very, a very simple instruction set, um, uh, uh, you can do these. Um, uh, 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 
these kind of yeah, one is so much more efficient than Intel. Um, real quick, Luke, just some some technical issues here. Yeah. Um, so I see you connected twice. Um, I see an L for a Luke, and then I see an L two. Are, are we getting sound from both yes, of those? Yes, um, that's my, lap, my laptop still upstairs. Oh, uh, okay, okay. All right, so never mind. And we're we're only <laughs> we're only getting sound from one. So okay, we're fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. let me see here. So. <laughs> What, what sort of innovation do you expect to see from a Libra GPU, Luke? This is um, uh, straight out of Atif uh, Zazar's uh, playbook from Pixelica. He did a presentation at the... Um, he did a buff at um, one of the GPU conferences in 2019. With a hybrid architecture where it is general purpose instructions, where basically the GPU has. Uh, GPUs are typically very, very specialist and very limited instruction. When you merge that with the CPU instructions, all of a sudden you've opened up a huge number of options to the GPUs because they can run general purpose instructions. Yeah. Okay. So, as a result of that, it would be very easy to do things like um, ray tracing, or to do tessellations, or to do anything other than absolutely dictated by the incumbent GPU mass volume companies. And, uh, they go after the supercomputer market and they go after the gaming market. And they don't care at all about the long tail okay. right, of the unusual things and the innovation. And what I think is that all, all of, because of the GPU mass volume uh, products for GPUs, it's based around the triangle. Any kind of innovation other than the triangle, well, there's no point in pursuing it because you haven't got the hardware. Yeah? So it remains in the realm of research, okay. um, academic, um, uh, theoretical research. Uh, um, what we've got now for you is because you've now got access to the full instruction set of a general purpose CPU combined with with 3D uh, uh, acceleration primitives. You can do these kinds of innovations and research. So I think we'll, we'll, in about 10 years time, we'll see a huge revolution in innovation um, of, um, uh, 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 of things, it's especially if we start to um, uh, hit um, NVIDIA and um, uh, uh, AMD, etc. as a graphics market, they'll start to go, oh shit, we'll start trying to look at this sort of thing as well. Um, yeah, it, it, over time, it's, it's, things should wake up and it's just a lot. So, so I, I just want to recall the viewers here, you know, there, there was an interview with Linus Torvalds where he flipped off NVIDIA. For those of you who couldn't see, Luke was flipping off <laughs> NVIDIA just now. <laughs> So Basically, yes. Um, the, 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 um, yeah. <laughs> and, and Intel and AMD and Imagination Technologies and Armali uh, and Vivant and everybody, basically. So... <laughs> So, so what you're saying is, Luke, your design for this GPU is like, what do they call that, next generational? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, that, that's, that's pretty awesome. That's, that's pretty awesome. So let's see here. So, uh, Power 9, in my, forgive me, I'm not a very techie guy. I, I run Linux, but I'm not a developer by any means. But um, Power 9 and Risk 5 seem to be a pretty good path forward for open hardware um, 
Do, do you, let's see here, do you suppose Intel and AMD may become more open if we start um, taking away their business? Kicking and screaming, eventually, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, it, around the 1990s, um, Intel and AMD got into a patent, patent bun fight in mm -hmm. which even the judge got fed up and said, my ruling is I am banging your heads together. I am not going to make a ruling. Wow. My ruling is I am not going to make a ruling. Go away and bloody well sort yourselves out. <laughs> cross-license each other's patents. Okay, and that was the ruling. He refused to rule. There was so, it was case, but you've got this patent, and I've got this patent, but you've got this, but it, another thing, it, it was, it escalated into sort of a, 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 um, a, a nuclear exchange stand on, avoided by the judge taking away the uh, keys of the of the things and they literally bang their heads together and say sort yourselves out um so so they did they cross licensed each other's patents now if they um the reason why open power is successful open concept is because ibm the major patent holder its patents to a patent pool where as long as you demonstrate compliance with the V3.0B specification, you gain an automatic royalty-free grant to those patents. Wow. Uh, also, very interestingly, if you any of, if you take any kind of litigation against IBM, or any of the Open Power Foundation members, you automatically, irrevocably lose that patent like royalty free. So it's a really big stick that IBM has, has uh, sort of put in behind its back. <laughs> and said, play nice. <laughs> now, for, for, for x86 to become open in the same fashion, Intel and AMD would have to negotiate at an agreement of a similar level, right, and put, and put, and do the same thing. But because it's both large companies get involved with that discussion, remember, IBM, behind the scenes, has been creating the open power license, the open power and user life license agreement, 10 years. There's been, there's been a, a group inside IBM who very quietly have been negotiating and encouraging IBM to do this for a long, long time. Ironically, contacted by people, by their friends, saying, Hey guys, there's this risk five thing. You know, you should really start doing this. <laughs> right? That was about four or five years ago. Unless <laughs> um, they had to say to them, well, "Yeah, we have been. We, but you know, we have been doing it. Please don't tell anybody right now." But you know, um, uh, uh, it's just that doing it properly. So, um, yeah, it's it's quite a. Uh, interesting thing going on that has been going on in the background, and finally it was ready. Everything was in place, all of the legal, and um, uh, IBM and the Open Power Foundation were able to announce the end use license agreement back in December 2019. All right. It's kind of cool. Right. Uh, um, so, one thing I would like to say is and risk five you say they seem to be the best open hardware we've always had there's a couple of things here we've always had um uh open risk 1200 um, o, um or1k has been open for about 12 to 15 years now and it, the thing, thing is that it was designed 
that is um, embedded running on FPGAs only. It was never no, no 32-bit. So it was never conceived as a commercial supercomputer-style thing. And it took a long, long time for them to create you know, the Linux kernel and libc6 and the GCC compiler, etc., etc. But it was all successful. But the fastest ever OR 1200 being manufactured is only 300 megahertz. Ouch. Um, yeah, um, because it's to do with the way that the, the, the implementation was done in an FPGA. And again, it comes to the thing about that open hardware, just people, very unfortunately, in the community, they have, they're, they're, it's the sort of a dissolutionment that they could even enter into the 28 nanometer or the 12 nanometer market, so they don't bother to this card where they can do it. Yeah? Yeah. What would be fantastic is that the Google Skywater program has blown that assumption up. Right? There are people now submitting one gigahertz surdies and other things to uh, the Skywater program the, for, fa for the eFabulous service. It's fantastic. So, Normally, the cost of this would be immense. You know, I mean, like, uh, uh, NLNet has very kindly funded um, one tape out for us, uh, 18,480 nanometer with iMac. 18,000. Where is it somebody in open hardware is used to buy $99 FPGAs going to get 18,000 euros from? Uh, yeah? Sure. So, so you said the internet is so, funding a, a, a run for you guys? Yeah, a shuttle run with 189 nanometers with iMac, yeah. Okay. Um, how, how many... So that's to give us the proof of concept. How, how many devices will that uh, produce? Maybe 30, maybe 100 uh, 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 quad flat package um, uh, chips. Um, it's, a, it's just a test chip, right? But it's a proof open power scalar, open power V3 scalar compliant, although we haven't actually verified run the compliance suite, test suite. Um, but it's basically a dead off capable of on the integer side. Okay. Um, well, I, I imagine the, the number of people who want to play with one of those chips is high, so I'm just submitting our request for GNU Geeks if you want to, what sort of developers can play with it. Yeah. Uh, the, the first three are going to end up mounted on wall. <laughs> um, um, the others, they're pretty much like gold dust. Um, so, um, they will be available, but bear in mind, if there's 30 available, uh, 18,000 euros divided by 30 is a hell of a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but that would be money that could go towards d donations towards the the team to do um, to do stuff. I think so. It's not uh, a thing, but it's gonna, it is happy to commit to helping us out, um, then, um, yeah, we could probably arrange something. But it's, it's, it's not, um, it, 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 those kinds of, those kinds of costs that you would, you know, uh, we, we, we really want to keep the samples to send to whoever who's going to invest a million dollars, you know, that sort of yeah, thing. Sure. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's those kind of things, and to do critical testing, etc., etc. Who do you one thing I did want to say about mm -hmm. so one thing I did want to say about Power Nine and Risk Five. Um, uh, yes, they're open, but there's a different definition. You're probably aware of this. There is a different kind of definition of what open means to most of the people. Open in this case involves trademarks or, and compliance. So as long as you are compliant with what is in the instruction set, 
and can demonstrate and prove that verification suite, then you can say you are Open Power compliant or Risk Five compliant. Unless you can do that, you absolutely cannot do that. You cannot make that claim. And in the case of IBM, you don't get the protection of the patent pool either. So you have to play nice with the organization. Okay? Okay. And here's where they run into difficulties. Okay? I, I, I've made it very, very clear. I spent 18 months making reasonable, in good faith requests to the trademark holders of the Risk Five uh, trademark. Absolutely one single response at all. And what that means, because of the length of time involved and the number of requests, that the Risk Five Foundation has lost the rights to defend and hold the trademark. All right? That's, now, taking that to court is, and, and demonstrating it is a different map, okay? Okay. Than, than, but, uh, than, than actually think. But under the trademark law, it's very, very difficult to lose a trademark, but the Risk Five Foundation has, by failing to respond, in good faith requests for participation in adding to the instruction set has managed to lay the groundwork for the invalidation of its trademark. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thing. Um, the second thing is that they wasted an enormous amount of EU funded money by, by stalling and being completely disrespectful. I won't send you a copy of the message that I got from it. It was shocking. <laughs> now, by co complete, total contrast, the foundation has been, the people in it have been really fantastic. They, um, I can understand the foundation looked at us and went, Oh, well, that's a, they've got such ridiculous goals. Um, they have no chance at all of achieving what they've set out to do. Therefore, we're not going to bother to, to reply and respond to their messages. They cannot possibly be serious. Uh, IBM and the people behind the Ample Power Foundation have taken to heart what I've what I've proposed and it's going to take a long long time and there are going to be a huge number of hopes that we'll have to jump through um, including that we've got um, uh, are going to be in it for the long haul but they've been absolutely fantastic um, in um, accepting at face value um, our intention to improve the open power instruction set yeah, it, it, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And that really makes the difference. The other thing is that, um, and you can see articles online about this, that people who have huge amounts of experience with um, uh, uh, different instruction sets have noticed that Risk Five has some serious limitations when it comes to supercomputing. Okay. Uh, um, and... One of there's, there's, there's three key ones. One is that the load and store instructions don't have door and update or um, shift um, shift the, the um, shift and add. The load store up one is quite serious because you have to have extra instructions inside the inside the loop code the key loops. Um, the second thing is that they decided not to do condition codes, um, uh, condition codes or carry in and carry out. And it makes it very easy to implement a simple system for embedded purposes, but it severely punishes long integer mathematics um, and various other things. Uh, you only want to do big integer maths about 1024 RSA, um, Diffie-Hellman, all those sorts of things. Um, 
uh, it, it severely punishes those types of algorithms. Um, and the third thing is that they made an assumption that people would use uh, macro fusion of longer sequences of instructions to uh, substitute for what could be done in a single, in one single instruction in any other in other instruction set. And what that means is that it, your programs are bigger, which means you have to have a bigger level one cache, which means you have more power consumption, which means you are less efficient in the in a supercomputer data center. So, uh, open power by contrast has all of these things. Already. It's had them in for day one. It hasn't had the load store shift and shift and add, but it's um, apart from that, it's had all of the basically. Open power is inherently designed as a supercomputer efficient supercomputer instruction set. And it shows in the fact that if you look at the top two um, supercomputers in the world, they're about 5 to 10% more efficient than the equivalent um, x86 ones. <laughs> the x86 ones are also at the top of the list. Okay, so so you so open power supercomputers are still holding their weight against Intel. Uh, if you look at the top list, top five hundred supercomputer list in the world, uh, the, the, the two two out of three of those are, are power nine. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. I, 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 thanks for explaining that. I didn't, I hadn't realized Power Nine was that much of a workhorse. Jeez. Yeah, it, it's basically, um, open power is one of the best kept secrets in the industry, and that's something that a lot of people quote. They just because it, because it's mostly fed up by IBM. You know, and IBM serves customers who don't really want to talk about what it is they that they do in their business. <laughs> Okay. I don't want really want it known. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we, we just don't we just don't hear about it, and the rest of the you know, the talks about x86 and about x5 and uh, arm and blah blah blah. <laughs> okay. Uh, are are you hoping to get uh, one of those Blackbird computers at some point uh, from Raptor Engineering? Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe, although actually because I've got um, uh, uh, um, Tim Pisson engineering has sponsored the LibreSoft project with um, access to a virtual um, uh, uh, Talos to a workstation. Um, I think it's very, very kindly we can do an SSH into it and do what we like with it. Um, but at people in the team, I would very much like um, to see Alexander Oliver have a uh, be donated a Blackbird system um, because um, uh, uh, he's currently running a very old ThinkPad uh, laptop with, and it's not coping very well with um, um, the, with you know the meetings uh, we do with uh, Jitsi. Yeah, the fan is going all the time, and it's yeah. What, what? So he could really do with that. Oh, Alexander Oliver is that his name? Yeah, he's on the board of directors of the Software Foundation, and he's a GCC developer. Um, he's been helping us out um, All right. uh, 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 with um, with. Uh, we'd very much like to see it succeed as well. Yeah, we should definitely um, so, donate uh, a Power Nine machine to Alexander Oliver, everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah please. Because <laughs> the, the the thing is that it's. It's, it's basically uh, like the uh, ThinkPads, the older ThinkPads. It's uh, Zebra, which is the bedrock with the firmware and everything. You know, the okay. bias bootloader and everything. Yeah, it's a, I'm right now I'm running a, uh, a, a, a Retno, what do they call it? Leah Rose OS boot, which, which is Libra boot, on a ThinkPad 2400. Which is fine for my for my use case, but I'm just seeing more and more of these Intel vulnerabilities, and I'm just I'm wanting something at some point. Yeah, yeah, I know. Ah, uh, the latest one was really funny. Okay. They lost the master master uh, firmware signing. That's been reverse engineered. 
Um, and it means that with the loss of the master signing key, you can sign any firmware for any processor and overwrite the firmware inside any Intel processor, uh, past, present, and future. Uh, um, and as a restriction that is executed, you can rewrite the firmware for it to do anything you'd like, such as just do this add computation, and oh, by the way, pass the results over to this um, black box over here, will you? Did, did, <laughs> does that require physical access to exploit? No. Oh, God. You just have to, over, you ha you just have to, ha you just have to hack the BIOS, the firmware in the BIOS of the, of the person's computer. Uh, um, and the next time they reboot, it will upload that that compromised firmware to rewrite the instructions on a processor. So just just because <laughs> I'm curious, be, because I'm running Liberboot, does that make it? Does that make that exploit harder to to use? Uh, if you're running Liberboot and you flash the uh, the NOR SPI uh, thing with a, a, a new BIOS, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then you're probably okay. Uh, here's the thing, is that if somebody else um, uh, hacks your computer over your internet connection and gets uh, puts on a Trojan which rewrites the Libra boot BIOS uh, source code and reflashes that thing, then you're host. Okay. I, yeah. I I think we're okay, I, but be, because I think I have to mount yeah, yeah. Linux a certain way to reflash it, so I think we're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there was a hardware switch uh, which stopped the right act to the SPI NOR flash chip, you'd be okay. You could disconnect from the internet. You could flip that switch, write the write the NOR flash and then flip it back again and leave it alone, and then it will be all right. Okay. But that's just not something that people, the mass volume laptop manufacturers have thought about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Duh. Okay. Why would they want to? Why would they put the extra cost of that sure. pump, pump physical switch into the, into the bill of materials? Sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, it just costs their money. Uh huh. <laughs> Sorry. So, I, I guess I'll go on to the next question that I yeah. have for you. Let's see here. Um, so, so Linux has an open driver for AMD graphics cards. Why do you suppose those graphics cards require a binary blob? Um, okay, if this is the thing that I'm thinking of. Um, I don't know the exact answer, but what I do know is that um, AMD licensed their HDMI driver and HDMI RTL from Intel. Okay. And Intel provided them with a blog to upload for the HD con uh, the the brain dead HDCP. And for to initialize the HDMI interface to actually become, and so um, because that is licensed from a third Intel, AMD do not have permission to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and you've got two choices. Um, complain, uh, complain that AMD who can't do anything, or disable that blob and not go and not have an HDMI output. A choice. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Could, could, could you work around that by using DisplayPort or no? You'd have to reverse engineer that binary blob. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> this is just how it goes. And, and it, it, it's all a sort of a criminal waste of, 
of, of free software engineers time. Yeah. I've got, I've got, so, you know, because I've done a huge amount of reverse engineering. I did nine HTC smartphones back in 2003. Um, uh, there were some other things. I just, I just went, you know, this is so ridiculous that I'm not going to do it anymore. It will be more worth my while to redesign hardware to replace these incumbents with something that is um, and has a good business case um, than it would be to uh, waste engineers' time doing um, reverse engineering. Because they will just keep on doing it. Yeah. We're not going to fix the problem by continuing to clean and up to the mess of these companies that don't care. Yeah. They're sponging off of our time and expertise. We're the ones unpaid who are cleaning up their mess. I'm fed up with it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad... So, yeah, it's yeah. time to replace... So, well, thank you for working on that. I mean, I, I, that's definitely the right choice. Definitely the right choice. Um, okay, let's see here. What else do I have for you? So, oops, easy. Um, can, can you develop the Libra GPU, the, the Libra SOC, currently with, with free software only? Yes. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> That includes um, that we um, and contribute it to as well with following Libra ethical principles as well. So do not require that you have an account. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I self-hosted. Okay, awesome. I, I, I remember, I think when you were... Oh, you're talking to some guy about um, the the original SOC that you were building um, with like I think it had originally the specifications had two gigs with like some s supply issues you had to go down to one gig of RAM. Um, but what I thought was interesting about that whole project was that you 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 couldn't develop the 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 CAD stuff, you couldn't develop it on the system itself because one gig of RAM is just too small. <laughs> yeah, this was the AM68 um, A20. Um, yeah, um, KSAD, this was 2011. KSAD was so awful. Um, I did a, I spent several hours doing a DD3, to manually doing a DDR3 layout. Saved it. I opened it up and the fucking program had gone and deleted every single track that I'd done. Oh no! No warning. No warning what. Um, uh, um, but, and it's, and I, I, I sent a message saying, what the hell? And they said, oh, you've set some layer rules which, um, uh, put, which said that, um, uh, tracks on that layer are not permitted. So it's silently deleted. And I sort of went, why the hell is there no warning? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd given me a fucking warning, I would have moved them to a different layer. Six hours, six hours work lost. Oh, gosh. There were several other reasons, but I just went, I've had it up to here with this software. It's... I think it's had it, just had it. Um, that's it. Um, I'm, I'm using a, a proprietary software which is designed for professional use, not for um, not for for toy use. Sure. Now, in the intervening years, there have been some significant improvements to KSAD, but that experience once and um, I don't have a good reason to go back to it because. Um, um, it, it's too it's too quirky um, and too cumbersome compared to the very intuitive um, user interface. I've made a huge amount of efforts to explain the how intuitive the interface is of the professional programmers I've been using. Stone cold silence or just outright rejection, and that also meant you, you know if I'm going to the trouble of explaining how a professional software works 
and how good it is, and they don't want to listen, why am I wasting my time speaking to them? Yeah. So, um, that, that I just decided, you know, when they're prepared to listen, I'll be prepared to, 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 to let them know, but if they're not prepared to listen, I've got better things to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's sort of, it's practical, you know, I could, say, you know, you know, you can only do so much, you know? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize you the, the the more annoyed you get the funnier you become Luke. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's no point. Uh, you know, Dr. Stormman pointed this out to me um, in that talk with the the three M Deb meeting. You know, he said what when I what is this Dr. Stormman speak? He said when I first developed G- GCC. There was no Libra software left. All of the operating systems that I compiled GCC up on and developed libc 6 and, and etc., all of them were proprietary. So we had to make pragmatic decisions, and he had to create the lesser G- G- uh, GNU public license, the LGPL, which um, allows you to link, allows you to aggregate works he said it's not it does the gpl does not mention linking it mentions it's, it's compliant with uh, it's aligned with copyright law it it's it um it mentions aggregate works um a thing so the lgp it designs to allow aggregation of other people's copyrighted material with it without requiring that that copyrighted uh, third-party material be also released under a completely different license. Uh, the, um, it, it, it was very interesting to hear Dr. Stormont say the test of this, that he said, you know, you, you make your decisions based on a practical, pragmatic um, approach to every and, and roadblock that you think. And if there's a road, if there's a if there's a roadblock in your goal, you you make a, you have to make a decision as whether to, and what the consequences of that compromise might be. Um, and if if it's not going to have severe consequences, you just work around it. You just go and use the proprietary software. But you do this evaluation as to whether it's appropriate or not, and work, get towards your goal. Okay. And if the consequences of making that compromise are severe, then you don't do it. You put your foot down. Okay. Um, it, it's a case by perspective misunderstanding of uh, the whole approach of why the, the Free Software Foundation exists. Therefore, freedoms are everything. You must not compromise at all. It's like. God's sake, and even, this is really annoying, even fundamentally misunderstands what Dr. Stormman has been saying. He's, he keeps repeating it. Les Torvalds, in that in email interview a couple of weeks ago, fundamentally repeated false information about what Dr. Ed <laughs> it's 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 yeah <laughs> I, 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 I'm of the same opinion I, yeah I, I'm of the same opinion I, I agree with you I think I think the GPL is the preferred license and yeah I, I get you <laughs> um, but it's not the absolute license that's true that's 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 the the, um, that's what people don't quite um, uh, 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 you keep 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 misunderstanding. Anyway, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see here. So, so it, it, in in my estimation, and I you know I'm not a techie again, but in my estimation, you seem to be kind of the leading force behind open hardware. 
Um, Raptor Engineering is doing some pretty cool things too with their stuff. Um, but you know, you, you mentioned earlier you were you just have you're kind of fun. You you want you want to pursue doing fun things, and that's probably where you get your drive from. Um, what other words of encouragement can you get other people to, um, you know, help you out in, in what you're doing? Okay. Well, it's a couple of things just, uh, um, I should make uh, clear. I seem to be the leading driver behind, uh, behind open hardware. That's kind of unfair to everybody else who is uh, also behind open hardware. There okay. is a massive amount going on. Um, uh, which may not have the same impact, but, uh, you know, the same um, deeply ambitious goal, should we say. Uh, nothing else is quite as ambitious as what we're trying to do, but there is still an enormous amount going on. Um, we have to understand and respect that. Okay. Um, uh, there's the... the, you know, the, the We've been doing this for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, the, 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 the original effort was behind open course, um, open course to look. Um, those people still go around this, so it's still going, um, and, and so on. So there's a lot going on there. Um, just to, to make clear, um, I am a bit pathological in how things. Um, I make a decision by an analysing and looking for an ethical imbalance in the world. Okay? Um, and I will make a decision of what to do based on and how to achieve So I'll come up with a plan that if this was fixed it would, and the world looked like that, then it would require us A, B, C, D, and E, and F, and G to get from here to there. And then I'll go ahead and get on with it. Now, some of those steps are not necessarily fun. <laughs> right? but it, you know, they're painful. I d it was deep to go through the experience of being hated by people on the risk five mailing lists. Yeah. I would not wish it the way that they viewed me on anyone. They will answer for that, but it will not be me that that, that makes them pay. Sure. Right. Or well, some point down the line it would not surprise me if they if there was a, an EU antitrust case brought against them. Wow! And it would be it would be because because they violated trademark law okay. and wasted and wasted European Union grant money okay. by failing to respond to my request to participate in the in the process whilst not lose or whilst this is the important bit whilst also not compromising on the business which required from the end on that grants required full transparency. Yeah? Sure. Okay. So they, they, in the, in the Risk-5 Foundation, they have this conflation of the only way that if you join the Risk-5 Foundation, which requires the start signature set signing of a, an agreement, which quite reasonably in their mind, and actually quite reasonably, as far as um, business, um, uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, antitrust regulations and non-competes things are concerned, but it, um, and um, very interestingly, the Open Power Foundation, IBM, specifically required that the only reason that, that in the transfer of the ownership of the instruction set to the Open Power Foundation. They required that RFC, Request for Change, be submitted without requiring membership of the Open Power Foundation. And that's very, very significant for us. Um, and for other Zebra contributors as well who would like to 
take responsibility for main, the maintenance um, and development of uh, long-term maintenance and development of uh, an extension to open power, an official approved uh, ratified um, extension to open power. Whereas the Mission Life Foundation specifically said, if you join them as a member, you sign our agreement, if you don't like it, go screw yourself. Oh, wow. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, uh, which, uh, basically, every... The thing is, the European Union is funding a huge number of risk five projects. And I spoke to the, um, the, the, the director of the grants for the European Union back at the FOSDEM 2020, um, and he said, we're funding risk five projects. We don't, they haven't got this problem. They said, how many of those projects are need to do official upstream modification side of instructions instead by submitting an extension? And he went, oh, none of them. Yeah, and I said, yeah, there you go. Because a, a, a hybrid 3D GPU, it's a very public, very prominent a significant modification to the actual instruction set and we, you, you can't do a I was told by people repeatedly oh go away into a little corner you time waster you can do this as a custom extension go away <laughs> yeah right which is extraordinarily disrespectful but if I had gone ahead with that and we produced a hundred million risk five processes with instruction set, it would have completely opened the whatever custom space was observed space but as a, a de facto standard. So um, uh, we couldn't do what they demanded that we do anyway because it would have damaged even our reputation as well as the risk five uh, um, uh, ecosystem. Okay. Um, yeah. It's quite an interesting, involved um, uh, thing there. It's quite complex. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, well, that, that's rough. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for highlighting that there are other people working in the open hardware space. Um, yeah, I'm just totally ignorant of that. I, you have very good marketing, Luke. <laughs> Western Damn. Digital's lawyers. <laughs> well, well, you won't. You won't because okay. it, 
it, it, they followed the rules of the Risk Five Foundation, didn't they? Okay. Yeah. Okay. They would have followed exactly what the Risk Five Foundation said that you had to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it's it's uh, it's a, a foot uh, it, it, uh, it's a foot sh shooting exercise. The the um by by the by the uh, thing. But yeah. Anyway. I've said enough about it. <laughs> well, thank you for explaining, because, I mean, I, you, you'd always been very, um, uh, I'm not sure what the proper wording is, but you all, you'd always been very kind in your wording of talking about Risk Five. It was kind of nice to hear a better understanding of why uh, there's technical reasons, there's performance reasons why you don't want to go Risk Five, and there's ethical reasons, and... Going risk five would break risk five, so you want to go with power. I guess that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. It does. Uh, here's the thing: is that power is very much higher. Um, it is a supercomputer instruction set, and so the power is very much higher. And if you're looking for that level of performance, even in embedded, and what we do, what we're doing with the with the vectorization, we're doing clean star vectors. I uh, just discovered very recently that the concepts that we're doing has been done before. Um, in both uh, x86 with the red instruction and the Broadcom video core 4 has a rep or repeat as well. And we're just doing exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, uh, just in a bit more of a powerful way. So you have a rep prefix to, that embeds the Sailor instruction repeats it. So you end up with a much more compact program, and that's when you get power efficiency savings. All right. um, so what we're doing is, is um, doing, making programs more compact and power efficient, so that when you scale them up to supercomputers and GPU workloads, they're just that more power, that they're more efficient. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of cool. No, it's, it's awesome. Exciting. It's amazing. I mean, this is. I I think I think this is kind of the we're we're starting to see some fruits from people that have been planning and cultivating open hardware for decades, and it's kind of nice to see. Hey, we can actually start to buy things. This is awesome. Yeah. So. But it just takes a bit of deciding. I'm you know I'm going to take responsibility for this, and I'm going to see how far I can get. Yeah, definitely. That's that's the key. It's it's not assuming when I'm not assuming that anybody else is going to do this. I'm not assuming that IBM is going to do it. I'm not assuming that Nvidia is going to do it or AMD or Intel thing because they've got their own interests to serve and they've got their own customers. Yeah. So it's down to us to take responsibility. That just that, that just gave me chills. Like I feel like I'm listening to the general before the battle. <laughs> um, so the 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 I guess most people listening to the video, if they listen to this long, are probably really interested in when is this uh, Libra SOC going to be built. When can they buy it? Um, when is it going to be able to power their laptop housing and their cell phone housing? Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, we're, um, we're setting up uh, a VC funded um, business associates called Red Semiconductor. Red Semiconductor, we will what take the company that takes diamonds and puts them into silicon, actual silicon. Okay. Um, and what we're also going to do is, if we find anything else, anybody else is working on something that should be, um, is worthy of the Libra ethic, and um, we'll find it. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll work with them and, and put it into silicon. So, um, our roadmap at the moment is, is proof of concept trip. We want to do a gigabit router, gigabit chip. So because that will be 180 nanometer or 130 nanometer, it's likely to be the first chip that actually comes out. Okay. Um, as a single core, probably maybe about eight to 10 months. Okay. But we'll have to see how that goes, right? On the basis of that, we'll be jumping ahead. So basically, in two, 
once we receive funding, it will be about 18 months before we will have a core core chip available. And then we want to jump up to an eight core, so something like an i7 equivalent, Intel i7 equivalent, and then jump from there to a 16 or even a 64 core chiplet. And from there, we want to jump up to actually use that as a, on a, a supercomputer computer substrate base uh, chiplet uh, thing to create monster supercomputer um, thing years out from that. Jeez. So, um, the the sixty both the eight core and the sixty four um, uh, uh, available um, for a desktop and high end desktop use. So, so if I heard that properly, within two to three years, people could be buying a system on the chip from you and from your company that would rival a Intel Core i7. using a T400 laptop, so my requirements are not anywhere near su sufficient. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a gamer, personally. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. It, it, will, it, will be, it will be perfect. It, um, even, at the quad, even, if, even if it was just a quad-core quad one. Um, we, we're going to make sure, though, that unlike a lot of these system on chips, SOCs, especially the all-winner ones, they're limited to 2 gigabytes of RAM. Okay. Because at some point in the past, what uh, they did was they did a deal with some DDR memory five provider, um, where they restricted for a reduced reduced license fee. They restricted the, to uh, the memory uh, access to two gigabytes, and that's very annoying because the um, um, you know, things like the Pine 64, the RAM. <laughs> uh, the Pine laptop, limited to 2 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah. The Kiwi boards, limited to 2 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, some, other, some other board, single board computers now on these, um, you know, these embedded things, they've actually got the message. And I think... Uh, the latest uh, Pi 60, Pi 4 processor, and uh, that the latest bigger board um, can do like eight or sixteen gigabytes of memory. I think they're kind of, you know, the community has sort of like spoken and sort of bashed their bashed these guys' head against the wall and said, "Fuck, stop with the limited gigabyte of RAM what we get." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> question I have for you is how can people help the project? Uh, and a bit both an ability um, and a commitment 
times. Um, uh, we will be able to let everything up to a bit uh, higher them and, um, and, and back them to, to, to do what they want to do. All right. All right. Uh, well, Luca, I don't want to take any more of your time. I appreciate you uh, meeting me, interviewing me today. Um, it's been absolutely fun. Um, any other closing thoughts from you? No, no. Okay. I'm glad this has gone well. We'll see what technical thing hopefully has come out all right. Well, we will find out. I will close the interview now, I guess. But I will see you guys later.